Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. All right, you guys, I want to do, um, you know, I just want to do a little intro, but the message today is uh, it has to do with just do it. And so probably like two weeks ago, I was going through the valley. You know, how many of people have gone through the valley, right? Or if you're still in there, I will help you out. You know, I, it was, it was intense. You know, I, I've been serving God now f- faithfully for seven years. And um, I grew up in the church and then I left God for 10 years. And my parents were coming to church and they were praying for me. They were like, Lord, help her because she's going straight to H-E double hockey sticks. You know, that's how intense I was. And um, finally, I gave my life to Christ, and it's been the most amazing journey, but not all the time have I said, I love this journey. Not all the time have I said, I want to take this journey. Not all the time, oh, there's been times that I just moonwalked out of there, like, no, thank you, you know, I don't want to do this. But I've learned that because of I persevere, because I've endured, because I've chosen to pursue God, he's blessed a lot of my family, he's blessed my, he blessed, he's blessed me, I've seen you guys blessed, I've seen you guys testify how good he is, I've seen you, I've seen people come in that I still see now, that have came up here, gave their lives to Christ, and they're serving Jesus, and that's amazing, because only through God can we do that, and so anyways, I want to start with Psalms 84, so I was in the valley crying, right, crying in my room, (laughs) Jesus, please, help me, Lord, and, um, you know, I usually like to, like, do my devotions, and I'm all planned out and everything. But this time, I did the open the book and point, you know? I was like, Lord, speak to me. And um, he led me to this verse. And I'm just going to read it real quick. It says, blessed are those who don't drop their water. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn, where am I? The autumn rains also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. I'm like, thank you, Lord. What does that mean? What does that mean? You know? So I'm a words person. I'm like, okay, what does bless means? What does the mean in Greek? You know, I get really intense. But I want to take you through. Um, it says, blessed are those. And so those means, if you can put it up, those means a people who choose to separate themselves, to follow someone or do something, choice chosen, those peeps over there, right? Those peeps. So if you're chosen and you've chosen to walk this life for Christ, you're blessed are those. And then it says whose strength is in you, right? So that means strength in you means trust. It means surrenderance. And I don't know about you, but I was Miss Control Freak. Like, no one's going to tell me how to live my life. Jesus, you know. <laughs> but I, you know, there's places where I'm like, Jesus, you need to help me because I don't know where I'm going. And then the next part says, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. And pilgrimage means, um, it means the long journey to a sacred place. So it says, whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on the journey. And I was in this valley, right? I was in the valley of Baca. I want to get shirts that say, get me out of Baca. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Please let me know. I'll hook you up. Um, get me out of the valley of Baca, you know? So it says, as soon as they pass through, that's a promise of God, number one. That's one promise right there. It doesn't say you're going to stay there. It says you will pass through. But I love what it says, set on the journey. And God spoke to me. He's like, if you don't look at the next journey that I'm going to take you and set your heart that you're going to finish it, you will not go through. And that's because I chose that. I chose not to set my heart on the finish line. And so God is like, once you set your, your heart on the journey, your perspective changes. So number one, set your heart. Number two, your perspective needs to change. Okay. Um, I come from a come from H double O D. I come from the hood, you know? And so, uh, and so I was, you know, everything was like, I don't trust you. I had my walls up. I was like, I don't know who you are. Um, 
nobody had a say in my life. Literally, literally, you know, problem with authority, I could not be led. But God was like, I need to lead you. I need to set your hope and your eyes on me in order for you to pass the journey and go from glory to glory. We like that saying, right? We're going from glory to glory. We're like, yes, God. But in between, there's a valley. In between, there's a valley. And we're not going to go from the top and all of a sudden we're like, you know, those Asian commercials where we're just flying from top to top. We're going to go down. You know what I'm talking about? We're going to go down and it's going to be dry. You're going to be thirsty. You're going to want to give up. You're going to want to moonwalk, moonwalk back to the top. You're going to say, no, God, not this journey. You're going to say, no, God, not this promise. Because it's hard. Because I don't want to do it. Because it's work. You know? And so number one, set your heart. So before you take the journey, you set your heart. Number two, you change your perspective. When you set your heart, your perspective changes. If you say, I'm going to take this journey, but I'm going to see how it is, you're going to go back. How many, you know, there's been times where I've raised my hand. I used to go to church, even though I was like in the club. I used to go to church and I used to raise my hand, God, forgive me. I want to live this life again, you know, but, but I didn't set my heart on the journey. I just said yes to him, but I didn't want the work. I didn't want to walk. I didn't want to run. I didn't want to go to the journey. And so guess what? I went back. Because I didn't set my heart on the things above. Because I didn't set my heart on God. And so, and then once I set my heart, so now, you know, I'm 23. Now, I'm not going to tell you my age, but this was seven years ago. Make the math. (laughs) I was 23 going into um, Elevate Church, and I left my life behind. I said I was, um, I said I was going to be famous and I started doing a lot of things in the industry and I had dreams and aspirations and I seen the finish line, but it wasn't the will of God. It wasn't because I felt lost as ever. Um, and I said, God, I surrender this. And that day, December 16th, it was a Friday, 2010. I said, God, I trust you and I'm going to set my eyes and my heart on you, no matter the cost. And because I said that on that day, I have not looked back. And because I choose to say that every day, I don't look back. Yes, sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm playing Lot's wife sometimes. Like, man, I've came this far, but I can't. Test. I can't go back. You can't go back. You can't go back. I don't care if this is your first day in church, you can't go back. It took you a long time to get through those doors. You can't go back. You, the, you brought three-fourths of your family here. You can't go back. You brought one of your friends. You can't go back. It was funny. My BFFs, I don't talk to them right now. I don't talk to them anymore because we were, we're not on the same page anymore. Their hearts are not set on, my, on what I'm set on. And so number three, after you change your perspective, you get your praise on. You get your praise on. And you know what's awesome? That I'm going to use this board because I think I'm cool. So number one, set your heart, right? Set your heart. Number two is change your perspective, right? Change your eyes. Like that? All right. Change your um, eyes. Change your perspective. And then number three is praise. I'm going to give you a secret. You can't praise without doing these two. You cannot. That's why you find yourself in this room sometimes hard to lift your hands because you've not set your mind the day of to continue the journey. And I know I've been up here last Wednesday. Let me just keep it 100 and real. Last Wednesday, I was like, man, God, I want to sing these songs because they're true. I want to give my heart to you, but I feel disconnected. This is when I was in Baca, you know. And, and, and God said, you have not set your heart in the next journey. You have not changed your perspective. And once you do those, then you praise. God says that I'm the author and the finisher of, my, of your faith. I'm the beginning and the end. Alpha and omega. So why are we tripping? Right? Why do we say, I don't want to praise? God says, all you have to do is praise me. When we praise God, that means I trust you. I trust you, God. And believe me, I'm human. I'm not a robot. I super feel it. You know, the feelings are real. But I've chosen to continue. I've chosen to keep going. And so, so I wanted you guys to know that there is hope after the, the, the Valley of Baca. And you know what's crazy? That the Valley of Baca means the Valley of Weeping. 
okay? And so there's going to be times where you weep in the valley. And I love what it says. Okay, so after it says, um, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. They, what's the definitions of, of they? It says, a group of people in authority regarded collectively. So they means you have authority to choose. Authority means the power to choose. God said, I've given you the authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. It means that I've given you the authority to tread upon those temptations to go back. I've given you the authority. I've given you the power to choose Jesus. But we have to choose it. Once we change our heart, once we change our perspective, and once we choose the journey, he says, I will make springs. You make the springs. And so... Um, you made me nervous, so I'm like, what is going on? So all I want you to know today is that there is hope after the journey. Because guess what? You're going to go through another journey, and you're going to have to look back and remember, hey, I passed the Valley of Baca, and I'm going to the Valley of Saka. No, I don't know. You're going to go through another valley. <laughs> you're going to go through another valley. And the end of the scripture, I'm done. The end of the scripture says they go from strength to strength. That is the strength because you've already passed one valley. And so be encouraged today. If you're in the valley, there's hope. The first promise that it says here is that you will pass. So amen. Love you guys. I think I was in Baca with you last week too. Can I actually get that table up here if that's okay? That one right over here. Thank you. Um, you know, so it's just do it, right? And Pastor Virginia did this amazing demonstration last week about, you know, she's holding the, the tube of the toothpaste and she's telling the tube, toothpaste, come forth. You guys remember that? Yes? Just a quick little recap for you. Um, yes, thank you. And she talked about opportunity, right? And, and when we say to just do it, obviously we're talking about opportunities that come your way and we're telling you to just do it. And in my journey, and, and a lot of you in this room know this about me, in, in the early part, actually the second week of January in 2017, the Lord told me and my family to press, okay? And every time I want to get away from this word, God's just like, tell him to press, tell him to press. I was like, I don't want to press. And he's like, tell him to press. And so, you know, I was thinking about opportunities. And I was thinking about how when there is an opportunity in your life, she was talking about opportunity to forgive, opportunity to love, opportunity to, uh, opportunity to give. Whenever there's an opportunity, there's a process. And whenever there's a process, there's a press. Press means to exert a steady force. I don't know where you guys are at in your life today, but I know that there's many of you in this room that are stuck. You need breakthrough, and you can't break through. You are stuck on your own dreams. You are stuck on your past. You are stuck on broken promises. You are stuck in addiction. I don't know where you, you are at, but I know that many of you in this room are stuck. And God wants you to break through. Your next step has become so incredibly predictable. When you're at work and that coworker walks in that you don't like, you're like, oh, there she is. That's predictable. Your thought process. When your husband says something and your response, predictable. When your child acts up and the way you parent them, predictable. And God wants you to re-strategize. He wants you to change it up. He wants you to fool the enemy. You really want to piss the enemy off? Go in some souls. You really want to piss the enemy off. Stretch your hands out to that coworker you don't like and say, hey, let me pray for you. You need to re-strategize. You guys have become, I'm predictable. Trust me, my husband, okay, I do this thing where I never close the kitchen cabinets, okay, just, I confess. And he's always like, ah, oh, there you go again. Super predictable. And I've made it my vow. I've honestly made it my vow that I'm not going to do that because I know it bothers him. And I love him. And he's the leader of my home. And that bothers him. So I'm going to change it. I know it's like the dumbest example ever. But, I, but you know, it's, it's the truth. If you want to break through, you need to break through your predictability. You better press, okay? Press. And when God told me to press, he said to me, so well, you have patterns and habits over and over again, and there's moments and areas in your life where you revert to the person that you used to be, but I need you to press, not push back. It's the same. You see that? Push back and press, it's the same. 
But pushing back isn't getting me anywhere. Pressing is getting me forward. You have anxiety, you press through your anxiety. This, these are olives, okay? When you press an olive, you see that? There's that oil. What does that oil mean? That oil represents anointing. What's anointing? Power. Power of who? The living God. The power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. You have fear. You press through that fear. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but I've given you one of power, love, and a sound mind, Jesus says. You press it doesn't feel good. It's uncomfortable. You press. When he wakes you up early in the morning and he says to you, have commune with me, pray with me, talk with me. I want to reveal things to you. Get on your knees. You press. You want to break through? You break through. And you eat the word of God. You put it so well inside of you that it comes out of you. That when trials happen, when, when, when your husband loses his job, my husband lost his job, you stand and you say, you know what, God? You will meet all of my needs. Because your word says that obedience commands blessings. And I am obedient and I tithe and you will make sure that my little kids will be fed. And I press, and I press, and I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't feel like it. But you know what, guys? Jesus did not feel like carrying a cross. He did not feel like carrying a cross to Calvary. He didn't feel like it, but he did it. Why did he do it? So that you could be saved, so that you could be whole, so that your marriage could be restored, so that your prodigal sons and daughters can come home. He carried a heavy cross, broken, bruised. I shared this with the women, and I didn't know I was going to go there, but I'm going to go there now. Cat and nine tails. This is what Jesus was beaten up with. Handle about 18 inches long, nine leather straps, six feet long, and at the end of each leather strap, there was pieces of bone and metal. And every time, whoo! It would go and it would rip out his flesh and he's carrying this cross and he's going and he's going because he didn't feel like it. No, he did it because he loves you. He loves you and he pressed through and he pressed through and he pressed through and here we are. We want breakthrough and we're not going to press. We want, we, want, we want to get out of debt, but we're not going to press. We're not going to tithe. We're not going to press. Here we want to hear from heaven. We don't open our Bibles. Here we want to say, God, I want to do your will. Sign up and serve. No, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to push back. I'm not going to press. I'm going to push back. I'm not going to press. And God wants to give you breakthrough. God wants his, he, he saved his best for you. You know, it, it, this is totally in the book of John, Jesus' first miracle that he does. He turns water into wine. Okay, and the groom takes a sip of this wine, and he says, this is kind of weird, because usually you save the good wine, you do the good wine in the beginning, you serve the good wine in the beginning, but you're serving the good wine at the end. Surely you have saved me your best. God will always give you his best. He will always give you his best, but you got to press. It's uncomfortable, but you gotta, you got to love people. You press through that. You got to go hang out with your family members that you don't like, but you're trying to tell them, come to this amazing church that I know. You're going to get breakthrough. You're going to change, and you're not going to press through that. You're laughing because it's true. <laughs> you want breakthrough? Then you need to break through. Then you take those olives and you press. My hands are super greasy right now. That's oil, guys. Oil is power. The power of the living God is inside of me. The power that raised Jesus Christ up from the dead, it's inside of me. And I choose to press. I press all the more. Paul says, press all the more. Press all the more. And one more thing. If you can go to um, 2 Corinthians, please and thank you. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. When you press, your insides are being changed, folks. You're inside, something's happening. You, when you press, there's this change that's happening. Your insides are changing. Your perspective is changing. Your heart is changing. Your thought process is changing. Your eyes are being fixed. And then he says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes. We just sang this. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It's eternal. When you press, you are forever changed. 
You are forever changed. You, I'm telling you, I didn't want to press. I didn't want to press through anything in my life. I just wanted to be comfortable. I wanted to wear my Thanksgiving pants. I just wanted to lay on my couch. I wanted to have an easy job. I wanted, to, I wanted my kids to, to be normal kids, to not run around. I wanted to have a great marriage. I, 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 wanted my, I, I wanted all these things. I still want all these things. But God is telling me it was not easy, Sogol. Jesus is like, it was not easy carrying that cross. It was not easy. The, alley, the valley of Baca is not easy. It is dry, she said. You will get thirsty, she said. But you press, and you press all the more, and you press deep, and you get into the word of God, and you let the word change you. You let the word transform you. You let the word just start jacking you up from the inside out, from the outside in, and you eat the word of God, and you digest it, and you swallow it, and it is in you. And once it's in you, it's going to come out of you. And everyone's going to look at you, and they're going to say, something happened to you. You changed. You're a different person. You are a different person. And then you become you're in the will of God. And once you're in the will of God, you're okay. Because you can turn left and you can turn right, but because you pressed, the power of the living God is inside of you. The power that raised Jesus Christ up from the dead is inside of you. So when that coworker comes into the room that you don't like, all of a sudden you like them because that power compels you to love. All of a sudden, when you, you have moments of anxiety, you are reminded there's this power that's inside of me that says, be anxious for nothing. When you have moments of fear, you're reminded that he did not give you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. When you have moments of confusion, he brings clarity. When you don't know what to do, he opens it up for you. Because if you press, and when you press, there is power. And it's the power of the living God. Amen. You guys are quiet. My hands are greasy. The last thing I want to share is the quick little thing that I just did about pushback. It's really the same force, right? This is press and this is pushback. Are you pushing back in your life or are you pressing forward? I pushed back for seven years. I pushed back. We started this church. I pushed back. I ran away. I had patterns that were horrible. And then the moment I decided to press, I saw God. I saw his hand move. I made friendships for a lifetime. I saw my marriage go to another level. I wasn't able to have kids. Lord, God, did you guys see my kids? I got like 17 of them. <laughs> I was not able to have kids. They told me that I could not have kids. One ignite. It was a glory night then. Pastor came and said, pray. I'm going to pray for you. And he said, the Lord wants you to know, daughter, your, your faith has healed you. And then I started popping babies out. <laughs> and, then, and then the enemy tried to take one of them away. Who was here for that? They said she has sepsis. But I pressed all the more. I spoke the word of God in my life all the more. I called on the local church all the more. I cried out to God all the more. And I said, you gave her to me and you can't take her away. Because she is not done. You don't have to be stuck. You can get your breakthrough. There's faith and there's works. And everyone in this room has faith. Because if you didn't have faith, you wouldn't be sitting in here. But are you working? Are you out loud praying the word of God? Are you praying in the spirit? Are you reading your word? If you didn't have faith, why are you sitting here? Obviously you have faith. But you need to work. Wow, you guys are super quiet. You need to work. Open your word. Read the Bible. God wants to change you. God wants to transform you. If you want to break through, you need to break through. Thank you, Sogo, for not giving me a greasy mic. Amen, amen. Well, listen, church, let's go in our Bibles. We're going to keep this going. Go to Isaiah chapter 6. I don't want to interrupt what God is doing even in these first two sections of how he's speaking tonight. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. Now, just a little backstory before we get into this. This is just, this is the account of Isaiah speaking. He's, he's telling us uh, his experience, his encounter, what's, what's happening to him in this very moment. Uh, mind you, at this time, Isaiah was not a prophet. 
He was simply a, a political figure in, in the kingdom of Judah. He was not, he was not anyone ordained uh, by God at this moment. He was just a man, a man willing to put the cause in front of his feelings, to put the cause in front of all that he felt. Okay, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 says, It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. And the whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Let's pause right there. So, so Isaiah's having a moment where he's witnessing this incredible image, this incredible vision. He's witnessing it from a place of, uh, of not feeling worthy. And it's interesting because I, I think about this verse here. I think about as he's saying that I, I, it's all over. I'm doomed for I'm a sinful man. And, and it's funny. And we're singing this song, Oh, Come to the Altar. And I'm like, wow, this sounds a lot like Isaiah. Right? It, 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 he's, it sounds a lot like something Isaiah would have said at this moment. You guys waiting for me to sing? <laughs> so I, Isaiah's feeling, feeling unworthy. If I can remember the words, I would sing it to you. No, he, he, he's feeling unworthy. He's feeling broken. He's feeling like, like there's nothing left. He's feeling like, like, who am I to witness this vision of this great and powerful God who even the angels are bowing down before him. And here I am living amongst a city who, who, who is corrupt, who is broken. And it's almost like, okay, I'm going to sing it. It's almost like he's sitting there and he's singing this to God. And he says, I am hurting and broken within. I'm overwhelmed by the weight of my sin. And he's sitting and he's thinking, Jesus, you're calling. And, and Isaiah's having a moment where he doesn't feel like he's worth the cause. But then he continues because he realizes that the cause is greater than what he feels. Verse 6 says, then the one of the seraphim, he flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. Stop right there. Now, in this time, this is very interesting. Because in these times, a priest who has been chosen to enter into the temple. Okay, a priest. If a priest were to enter into the inner courts, into the holy of holies, and there was but one spot on his robe. There was but one thing. That made him unclean. Right at that moment, he would have dropped dead. But yet, a seraphim, a holy creature of God, comes and brings a charcoal, a piece of hot coal from the altar and brings it to Isaiah, who's filthy. A man who said, I'm not worthy, God went as out of his way to say, yes, you are. God said to man, said, said a creature to come and to prove to him, no, Isaiah, the cause is much greater than what you're feeling right now. And so he touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Do you see it now? Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. See the cross of Jesus, do you see that? That set you free. Do you see the blood running down his face? Do you see the flesh being ripped out as Sobel described it? That covered your sin. That covered your guilt. That removed your iniquity. 
Then I heard the Lord asking. Now check this out. This is, I thought this was very interesting. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Now, we're, we're not listening to a conversation between God and Isaiah. We're not reading a conversation between God and, and the nation of Judah. What we're seeing is at this moment, Isaiah had ears that were willing to listen into God's business. And God's business was that he was, he was looking, searching, and he was communicating this in the host of, his, of the heavenly host, in a host of angels amongst Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They're having this conversation. They're looking for someone. And Isaiah has the nerve, he has the boldness to get all up in God's business. Isaiah is not waiting for God to pull him in. Isaiah is not waiting for God to paint the picture of what this is going to look like. Isaiah is not being told of what his future is going to look like as he becomes one of the greatest prophets of the Bible. Isaiah is not waiting for someone to give him the one, two, three, and go. Isaiah said, no, forget the count. I'm getting in your business, God. Here I am. Send me. I'm ready. I'm ready to do it. And, and, I, and I, may, I think that's interesting because... I, Many times we wait for someone to jump ahead and take care of the problem. Sometimes we're like, man, why can't, you know, we're at work and we're frustrated. It's like, oh, why can't this person just do it? Uh, we're, we're hearing news on the, gov- uh, on the we're hearing news and, and bad reports of things. We're like, oh, why can't the government just do it already? And we're hearing these things and, and we're putting the responsibility in other people. We're waiting for other people to pull us into the business. When Isaiah is saying, I'm getting in the business. I'm making God's business my business. I want God to say to me, go forth and do. He's looking at the state of his nation. He's looking at the state of Judah, and he's realizing that this isn't a place that's worthy. This isn't a place that, that has it all together. This isn't a place that, 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 that should be considered a great nation. But yet he He's taking his encounter where God went out of his way, broke all the rules in the book, took an unclean man, and went out of his way to make him clean. Broke the rules. He's taking this experience, this encounter, and he's looking at it and he's weighing it. He's saying, the cause of my people is greater than what I feel. The cause of the people needing to know of this hope is greater than what I want to do. Isaiah then, he goes on and he goes on to become uh, the man who, who pronounces the coming of Christ, the coming of the hope of glory, the, the one savior that would die once and cover all. This is the man to proclaim that. So I believe that if Isaiah were here today, if he were standing here on this place, on this stage, And he were looking at us and he were giving one last message. He would say, just do it. Uh, What are you waiting for? Uh, Why are you waiting for that person to do it? You need to get in God's business. God, see, see, God didn't design us. He didn't design us so that we can allow someone else to accomplish what we were supposed to accomplish. He didn't design you so that you can pass the buck to the person that you feel is more qualified. See, Isaiah Isaiah was a political figure. And I'm sure in his mind when he's saying I have filthy lips, he had said some things that weren't too great, that weren't aligned with a godly character. He had said some things that weren't aligned to the heart of God. He knew that his nation was a little inferior to, 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 to the things of God. He knew that at this moment that there was some turmoil and, and there was really no hope. But the awesome thing is Isaiah didn't need someone to say, Go and give these people hope. He felt the need to say it's worth it. So church, you're here tonight. You didn't come to church because you want to pass the buck to someone. You didn't come to church because you want someone else to handle your problems. I believe that everyone who showed up through these doors tonight, you're here because you believe that God has an answer for you to be a part of. That there was a problem and you decide to be the solution. 
that instead of waiting for someone else to take care of it, for someone else to do God's business, you said, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I know that, that, that the overwhelming state of where you might be may, 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 may get you to second guess, may get you to wonder, may get you to think that maybe you, you're not strong enough to carry the weight of this. Maybe you're not qualified enough to do what God wants you to do. And if you are there, then this is what you need to do. You need to take a step back. And when you go to work tomorrow morning, and when you sit at, at your place of work and you're getting ready to do your business, you need to look around. And you need to look at, at, at the things that may not look like a, a, a thing that lines up with God's character. And you need to remember what God did for your life. And how he broke all the rules for you. And how he was willing to bear the weight of the sin, not just of you, not just of the person next to you, but of the world. He broke those rules. He went out of his way and he cleansed you. He made you whole. So that you could come and you can step up and so you can say, here I am. God, choose me. I'll do it. I'll take care of this for you. Look no further. Look no further. And church, I believe that the moment we begin to look at ourselves in that position like Isaiah was, and we begin to to look at ourselves as, as people who, whether we're qualified or not, can carry the weight of God's business because we know that he is, he's backing us. All of heaven's hosts were backing us. See, Isaiah, Isaiah was doing all of this in the presence of angels, of God's hosts. Now, mind you, he went on to speak some things that were very heavy. He went on to speak some things that you don't want to hear all the time. He went on to, 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 to speak things that, that could have got him killed. But the cause was greater than what he felt. The people, the state of his nation, and the fact that there was a hope that just as God broke the rules for him, that he would break the rules for them was worth it for him. And so we're here tonight, and God's saying, is it worth it to you? Is it worth it for you tonight? Is it worth it to break your own rules? To break your own place of being comfortable. To break your own place of, uh, of wanting to be still and, and mind your own business. Are you willing to break out of that in order for God to reach someone and to bring them hope as well? That's what we take home in our hearts tonight, church. That's what we go and, and, and we wait no longer. Isaiah waited no longer. All he said was, here I am. Send me. I'm the one. Look no further. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.